Is it on now? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Bruce Warner. I'm the president of the TriMet Board of Directors. Uh, and welcome to the uh, regular September 26th, 2012 meeting of the Board of Directors. With that, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, we are missing one uh, director who will be here shortly, I believe. So uh, we'll get started with the uh, non-action items, the general manager and board reports. So Mr. General Manager. Mr. Board President, members of the, of the Board of Directors, I'm pleased to be here with you this morning. It's been a while since we've been together, so I have a few updates for you. Uh, I wanted to start off with a general review of where we are with fiscal year 15 by the I think there's uh, both good news and cautious news. Um, one is that the first quarter payroll tax results for fiscal year 13 are actually ahead of our projected level. So that's a, a good result. We all, all know that we can't bank on one quarter's results and that there's a great deal of variation throughout the year, but nonetheless, we're seeing um, an economic response in the economy that's reflected then in payroll tax receipts. Uh, on the federal level, I would just note that there's a whole lot of inaction. And so while we were very pleased to see MAP 21, the authorizing legislation passed, Congress has yet to follow up with appropriations for this year. We are at, on a continuing resolution that really runs through March at the same level of funding of last year, but all of the appropriation bills are still to be done. Um, and there's a great deal of uncertainty given what we've all heard of as the fiscal cliff that uh, Congress faces um, after January 1 and, and certain levels of sequestration that can affect the federal funding as well. So we'll obviously keep you very closely uh, updated on that as it develops. Uh, regarding the labor contract, we have, as uh, Randy said, and I'll ask him to come up here shortly, we have made all the retroactive uh, cost of living payments to our employees. We set aside $5 million to do that. That actually totaled to about $6 million. Uh, we're working on other uh, implementation actions, and I'm going to have Randy update you on that, uh, those topics. Um, but as you know, we also begin negotiating the next contract very shortly. The contract expires on November 30th, so we have a whole other round of negotiations and, and conversations with our partners at the union in. And finally, um, on the fare increases, we do know uh, that uh, we, this is really way too early to begin to see what the effect of the fare increases are and whether or not they're on plan or not, uh, what the effect on ridership is, but we'll, we're watching that closely. Uh, we should be able to have a report to you um, hopefully mid-October or thereabouts that really begins to give us the first month's review, but it probably takes a full quarter before we really know uh, the results of that. Um, I would note that when you approve the fiscal year 13 budget, you also approved a resolution that had a number of work items for staff to follow up on. At your October 10th briefing, we'll be going through the status of all of those um, items um, with you so that you know some have been completed, some are underway, and some will be continuing efforts over time. But we'll go through that thoroughly with you um, in uh, October. I would say there are a couple of other major unknowns that we continue to watch very closely. Diesel fuel uh, it has been very volatile lately, um, and then medical insurance rates. Right now, we think that is coming in maybe even a bit under budget, but uh, there's a great deal of uncertainty as we sort of move into that realm. Um, so all in all, I think we're holding our own, and we have a few things to watch and be uh, cautious of as we move into the uh, budget preparations. And the reason I wanted to bring this to your attention right now is that we are beginning to update our forecasts. We'll be sharing those with you in October and November as we did last year as we begin to prepare uh, and get our annual budget in a 20-year forecast of, uh, of expenditures and revenues. Um, so that updating work is underway um, as we speak. Um, so I just also wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, a great deal of work on the part of the staff to implement the service and fare changes uh, on September 1st. And I'd say generally there was a good uh, effort to put those new changes into effect. There were probably broader changes than we've seen in a long, long time around trying that. Um, what I've asked our staff to do is put together lessons learned on this so that we can begin to assess where we did really well, uh, where we did okay, and where we can do better next time and begin to capture those lessons for future implementations. 
one of the things you'll hear about, for example, later in this meeting will be about the electronic fare system. That could be another major change, and I think there's a lot to be learned from the experience we went through in, in uh, uh, September, early September, to make sure that we capture those lessons uh, for the future. And I'll be happy to share those, excuse me, uh, that, that result when it's complete with you. Another uh, major milestone coming is the deployment of our new buses. We now have received uh, most of our 55 new gilded buses, and starting next week, we'll be putting them into service. Uh, we're launching five next week. They will, um, every week, we'll see another three or four buses going into service between now and December. They're being launched. They were uh, from our PAL garage, um, and Merlot got the last two buses. PAL gets this one. The next one will come to uh, center. So we, we make sure we share them with everybody. Um, but I think this will be that actually very important message for our riders about how we value the bus system and the improved bus system that we see upcoming here in the, in the years ahead. Um, I also just wanted to uh, thank uh, Dr. Bethel and Board Member Stovall for, uh, <coughs> for coming to the streetcar grand opening, East Side Loop grand opening on Saturday. It was, a, uh, I think, a very nice event. Um, services uh, is continuing there. And as you know, we provide the employees for the operations as well as the maintenance. That staffing now is up to about 50 a streetcar. Um, so it's a fairly big deployment of our own staff. Um, and as you know, we pay about <coughs> half of the operating costs on going for streetcar. So we're pleased to reach that milestone. Um, they're, the service is running with a little bit less uh, vehicle capacity than they like right now um, as we await the delivery of the um, Oregon Ironworks, Oregon manufactured streetcars, which is expected at the, around the end of November. Um, so again, I think it was a very nice event and uh, very well attended by members of the community and those who have been involved in, in, in transit. Uh, I did want to call up uh, Randy Stedman to give you an update on um, labor relations issues and where we are with the implementation of the arbitrator's order. Uh, as, you, as Randy goes through this, you'll see why it's com more complicated than I wanted to tell you. So I bring up the real expert. Randy? Uh, good morning. Uh, as Neil mentioned, that we have, since the arbitration award, been implementing uh, aspects of the decision. We uh, have, re have paid the Pascola both to active and uh, retiree employees. We have gone through the open enrollment to, to implement the new plan design, and we have actually a, a, about 100 or so employees switch from the greater uh, cost plan to the lesser cost plan, which was good. That implementation uh, was uh, effective September 1st, and we have also implemented as of August 1st the union represented defined contribution plan. So those are many of the aspects of the uh, award. The remaining uh, part of the award is to implement a uh, retroactive to December 1st, 2009, the health care plan. So that involves the true up uh, of monies owed to employees and owed from employees based on the implementation of that plan, comparing the, the, the cost that they did pay to what they should have paid under the retroactive implementation of the plan. Um, that is ongoing. We've made a lot of headway. There's a lot of individual calculations for you know, thousands of employees, and we're, uh, as part of that, preparing a record, uh, basically an accounting, month by month, so that when it's implemented, employees will know exactly uh, what the figures are and how they add up and, and how that affects them. So that's a painstaking process. There's many iterations as people through the three-year period have changed plans. So that's ongoing. We're not, not yet prepared to uh, issue those uh, letters to employees. As you know, on August 8th, the uh, ATU filed an unfair labor practice charge basically challenging nearly every aspect of the arbitration award. Um, both before and after that filing, we offered to meet and confer with the ATU regarding implementation of the award, which they declined to do. Um, after the ULP was filed, Judge Greenwald, uh, ALJ with ERB, suggested that the parties uh, engage in mediation to try to mediate the uh, uh, implementation, and we uh, have agreed to that. that There's going to be a mediation on October 3rd, which I am hopeful will uh, bear some fruit. Um, however, at the same time that uh, we've agreed to mediate, the ATU has instructed uh, its members not to cooperate with implementation of the award, particularly the uh, insurance award. 
uh, initially, right after the award, uh, the APU sent an open letter to uh, Adam Collier, our attorney, and in that, basically, uh, they were instructing their their members not to uh, cooperate with implementation of the plan. And more recently, we sent uh, on the 18th or 19th of September sample letters. As we were getting near to the time where we could produce these letters for employees, we sent about eight samples uh, to the ATU for their input and comment and what are concerns that they might have as we continue to prepare uh, to issue those letters. On the same day that we sent the letter uh, to the ATU, they issued another letter instructing their uh, uh, members to not cooperate with implementation of the uh, uh, insurance plan. The ATU has also taken the position that uh, seems to us to be untenable uh, at, regarding the uh, binding nature of the arbitration. In a September 14th letter, they uh, indicated that no labor contract is valid or binding on a local union until such time it has been approved by the international. This means that the document Trinet recently circulated, a printed contract, is not an agreement and has no legal binding effect whatsoever. So that's clearly contrary to the statute. Um, based on that, we have uh, felt compelled to file an unfair labor pa uh, practice charge uh, today, uh, alleging that uh, their position with respect to implementing the war, again, particularly related to the insurance, is contrary to the statute. Uh, violates in particular two aspects of the statute. One, the binding nature of contracts, and the other particularly related to the binding nature of binding arbitration. So, um, so those are going along parallel tracks. We filed this ULP, but we also are hopeful that we will be able to negotiate in good faith and to reach some sort of an agreement uh, through mediation uh, that will uh, take place on the 3rd. Um, I think that brings us up to date. Happy to answer any questions. Questions, Jeff? So thank you. Uh, to what degree are uh, members of the union uh, complying with the request of lack of participation? Well, we haven't we haven't sent the letters yet. So all we have sent are were samples of letters as we we're preparing them to get input from the ATU. So the letters have not gone out and won't go out uh, prior to mediation. Uh, there's still quite a bit of calculating on the uh, on the more difficult. So uh, I don't know whether they will participate or uh, heed their union's uh, admonitions or not. I guess I said the question, did we jump the gun going ahead with the, the, the COLA, the retroactive COLAs and others if they were challenging the entire uh, uh, agreement? Well, they're not challenging that part of the agreement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think that it was appropriate for, go ahead, for us to go ahead and, and uh, pay the past COLAs. That really wasn't an issue. Uh, both parties uh, had in their last best and final offer to uh, award 3 to 5% COLA increases. Really no dispute about that. Uh, our preferred method of implementing the health would have been to uh, offset the um, COLAs against the health because that's a tax advantage approach for employees. There's still an uh, and we asked uh, ATU to enter into an MOU because we couldn't do that without their agreement and they did not agree. There's still an opportunity to do that. Uh, we can offset whatever insurance monies are owed from employees against future wages, again, with uh, individual agreement to comply with the wage deduction statute. So there's still that opportunity to implement it in a tax advantage to, aid, uh, to employees. Thank you, I knew the answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So the, the mediation that will take place on August 3rd, is that correct? October 3rd. October yeah. 3rd, yeah, this is behind us. <laughs> on October 3rd, that's, that's not binding, correct? Well, uh, the nature of mediation is the parties can discuss freely uh, things that are directly applicable. They could bring in other outstanding issues uh, that are somewhat unrelated. We would also want to resolve the implementation of Judge Greenwald's decision on the U what we've called ULP2, which basically awards the same sort of remedy uh, as the arbitrator did, but it's an independent uh, decision. So we would try to wrap everything together and as many outstanding issues uh, as we can, um, or if that won't work, more narrowly related to the ULP. So it's a pretty wide open discussion that we'll have, hopefully. 
And that effort is to try and bring both parties together and allow them to discuss with a mediator uh, kind of in the middle. Correct. But your question is, it's not binding. Correct. Yeah. Well, we would, as a result, we would enter into a binding agreement. If we came, if we came to an agreement, yes. Correct. 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 Other questions? I'm seeing none. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Board President, uh, right now it would be my honor to uh, bring to you our audit team from Moss Adams. Uh, I know that the uh, Finance and Audit Committee uh, did have a uh, presentation from our auditors uh, at their last meeting. Uh, in September, um, and I wanted to make sure that the audit results were shared with the full board here. So if I, I'd like to uh, introduce Julie Desimone, Nancy Young, and Anna Marie McNeil, who have been uh, at the forefront of this. Um, good morning. Good morning. We thought we'd start with a few brief introductions and let you know where, where we're going to tell you today. Um, my name is Julie Desimone. I am the partner in charge of the TriMet Audit. I'm Nancy Young, Senior Manager. Anna Ray McNeil, Manager. So what we wanted to cover today during this presentation is we wanted to talk a little bit about the nature of the services provided, uh, what we did for TriMet this year. Uh, talk to you about our results and our conclusions of that. Uh, a few, go through a few of the critical audit areas, um, some required communications that we need to make with you as um, our audit committee and full board. Uh, we want to talk very shortly about upcoming auditing or accounting standards. I know that's the really exciting topic, uh, but we promise to make it short and sweet. Um, and then just finish with a summary of, of the events uh, that occurred. So first of all, we do quite a few, we issue quite a few opinions for TriMet. First is, uh, and probably the largest opinion, is our financial statement opinion. So that's covering uh, the, the year-to-date financial statements for the past two years. We then also, in accordance with state statutes, also do a report on, on the Oregon Municipal Standards. So there's a, a group of standards that we have to, it's, it's extra auditing procedures that we do have to do for the state of Oregon. Um, our A133, our, our single audit, is the compliance over your federal grants, of which you just have a few. Um, so we, we take a look pretty extensively at the dollars on the federal, and, and really what this is getting to is, is are you in compliance with all the federal requirements? And this is submitted, actually it will be submitted later today, um, to the federal government for review. And then finally, the data collection form, which is that, that submission. So here's the good news. Um, we have an unqualified opinion on the financial statements. And unqualified is, is the same in an auditing term as a clean opinion. It's what you as a board of directors wants to see. Um, it's, it's very important uh, for when you go out for federal grants, financing, um, any external activities. It's, it's telling everybody that your financial statements are free of material <coughs> statements. As far as the Oregon Municipal Standards, uh, we did have one finding this year. I, I believe it's very, very minor. Um, it was more of an administrative item than anything else. Um, it was due to a change in the way that the budget was notified to the public. Uh, they, now, they now allow for it to be in the paper once, the notification be in the paper once, and then to be on your website, clearly displayed in a prominent place in your website. That occurred, but there's a little subset to the standard that states that you have to also, in your newspaper notification, tell them that where your website is, and that didn't occur. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been remedied um, and will occur for the next one, but that is the only finding. <coughs> Our, find, our, our, our procedures over uh, the Oregon Municipal Standards include contracting. Uh, we take a pretty hefty look at your contracting, both your, your formal procedures and your informal procedures, and, and the entire budget process as you follow the law as far as the budget goes. So having this one minor finding, um, which is easy to remedy, uh, is, is really a, a minor event in the whole course of events and what we test. As far as the single audit, you also received both in the governmental auditing standards and in the compliance on federal grants. We have no findings, uh, which I, I believe is a very important thing, seeing as that your continual um, federal dollars that, that flow into China. Um, next, we wanted to discuss with you or share with you the, the areas that we consider to be critical audit areas. Um, below on, on your slides, you have a list of those. Um, just to make you aware as well that we consider every area important. These are just the areas that we consider to either have either larger dollars or um, maybe more sensitive in nature. Um, and those included cash and investments, 
property equipment and construction projects, which is pretty much the bulk of your activities. Um, you have some um, pretty uh, uh, interesting or um, tricky sort of lease and lease back transactions that the district got into a few years ago. Um, so those are still on the books and, and require some additional um, testing for, from us to make sure that those transactions have been recorded correctly. Um, your pension accrual and your OPEP accrual are pretty big numbers and we consider those to be critical. Um, your debt, of course, and then your grant funding, that's the single audit, we do quite a bit of work there. And then the local budget law and Oregon minimum standards. So all of these areas, there were control processes that we tested as well as substantive tests of details. Um, and we found your controls to be working appropriately and um, found no um, deficiencies uh, with any of our testing in these areas. Now bringing you to the required communications. There's a number of items that we go over with you at the conclusion of the audit engagement. And some of these items we also discussed with you at the beginning uh, of the audit engagement. So the first one is just understanding our responsibility, which is to conduct the audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. And that's to provide reasonable assurance. And when we say reasonable assurance, of course, it's not absolute assurance. So for some reason, you don't want to pay us to look at absolutely every transaction in your, uh, your system. But we do provide reasonable assurance that the financial statements are materially correctly stated. We have some significant accounting policies that are addressed in the notes to your financial statements. And those financial statements also include management judgments and estimates. And some of those key estimates uh, that should be noted are your payroll and self-employment tax receivable, the useful lives of property, plant, and equipment, your claims liability, your employee benefit plan accruals, and your overhead allocations. And all of those, um, in each of those instances, we looked at management's assumptions and the numbers going into their development of those estimates, and we agree with those estimates. As far as audit adjustments made and passed, there were none, so we do appreciate that. As far as management's consultation with other uh, accountants, this is where if management didn't like the opinion that they were, we were giving them or going to issue, they might go out and, and seek a second opinion or do opinion shopping. And so we're pleased to report that you didn't do that. And being that you were issued an unqualified opinion, it's not going to get any better anyway. So <laughs> we had no disagreements with management. We have good, healthy discussions, but uh, nothing that we weren't able to come to agreement on. There were no difficulties in performing the audit. And we had no major issues discussed with management as a condition of our retention. And as far as audit uh, observations and recommendations, we've discussed with you already the, the one finding uh, that we had. The reason that we want to bring some aud upcoming audit standards or accounting standards to your attention, um, and I'm not going to go through these because I think that at least the first two, or the two on the top, probably deal with about 1,200 pages of documentation. Uh, but what we want to let you know is there's some significant changes that are coming down the pike as far as GASB is concerned. And, and now it is um, every business type activity of a local government, um, you are required to follow GASB as of this year. Um, so no longer are allowed to follow GASB, but GASB is coming in. Um, and you've always had to follow it, but you've had some leeway or been able to look at some of the FASB or the Financial Accounting Standards Board. I guess I'm talking in acronyms. I'm sorry. The Government <laughs> Accounting Standards Board. Uh, so they've been uh, working very hard, um, and there's some really large standards that are coming down and completely going to reshape either the accounting transactions that you're going to have in the future or what the looks of the financial statements are. For example, next year your balance sheet is going away. Um, now you're going to have something called a statement of net position, and there's probably going to have to be some consideration as far as um, getting, uh, making sure everybody understands where everything went to and mapped. Uh, luckily next year, this is the deferred inflow and outflows piece, luckily next year we uh, nothing will have to be written off, but unfortunately not, the following that next year, uh, there's a possibility of certain costs that are currently on your balance sheet that will no longer be allowed. Now, stepping back from that, this is something nationwide that every government, any entity that follows GASB reporting is required to do. So there will be a mandatory restatement of your financial statements, but it's not, it's just in the following accounting standard. Um, there's some significant pension and OPEB um, new events that are hitting over the next three to five years, um, and they're going to completely reshape what you actually are recording on your, on your financial statements or what could be recording. So there's going to be a lot of talk. And, well, the reason we want to bring these up is they're going to take some pretty significant time 
um, and attention from Bexar County Department. So, so you may hear about them um, you, as we get closer to the implementation. Uh, there's a lot of concern over what that's going to do to debt covenants. There's a lot of concern about what that's going to do when you enter the bonding markets. Um, and we'll continue to keep you updated on all the events um, that are going on throughout that. And talking, we're talking with management constantly about that. So that's why we wanted to let you know those events coming up starting next year and in the next five. So in summary, just again, we've issued a clean opinion on the financial statements. You have no findings under federal funding or your debt compliance. And there's just the one minor finding uh, related to the Oregon uh, legal compliance. And also in summary, we'd like to thank uh, Dave Oxier, uh, Beth DeCamel, and Lori Baker for all their, their patience and work with us in getting, getting our work done this year. We do appreciate it. Any questions? In looking and looking forward to the upcoming audit standards, uh, you specifically mentioned the, print, the pension and OPEP projects. Mm -hmm. Are there some highlights that you can give us? When we think about, I think at least when I think about some of the great concerns that we have as an organization, and it's come up uh, in some of the testimony that we received, this OPEP and pension situation is something that uh, brings along some significant concern. Uh, so it's, it would be helpful if there's any highlights that you can give that allow us to start looking towards the future and have some sense of uh, what may be coming down the pipeline. One of the things that you know I, my mind goes to is, and this may be just how we report information, but are there any things that, uh, anything coming along that may change our level of contribution that we have to make towards uh, our pension and OPEP situation uh, that could affect our daily operations and cash flows and things like that. Right. Well, that's an interesting question because uh, they did not uh, they did not come forward with any funding requirements. So Gasby cannot force any type of funding to any specific plan. That is a, a managerial decision on how much actual cash goes into the plans. Or if you uh, you know right now you kind of set it more to a pay as you go as the benefits are needed. That's when the the cash is is out the door. It is some it adds some funding that the board has decided to do. Um, what is the different? The main difference is going to happen. It, there's two types of plans. There's the single employer plans and the multi, like the state purse plans. Those are the plans that are going to be hit by far the largest because right now those are not reported on individual cities' books. Um, it's just a two paragraph of disclosure, um, and they're breaking all those multi, those large purse plans up, and they're going to put the unfunded status on the financial. So that's the biggest change is that instead of having what they call it now is the annual required contribution or the actuarial the liability, mm -hmm. now they're converting to the unfunded. So they're gonna say, here's your liability, what we think your future liabilities are, minus what assets you have in the plan, here's what's not funded, and that's gonna be the obligation on your balance sheet. Um, which, and it, what's gonna be interesting, we start looking state to state and a business perspective from it, um, is what debt holders, what anybody outside is really going to be able to see what your future sacrifice is going to need to be made. Where right now, there's that that future sacrifice isn't really reflected on the financial statements, just of the way that the. Now, I will say, let me step back and talk about China. You guys have gotten a long, you've gotten a long ways. Um, you've already started talking about it, discussions that you're having. It shouldn't change a lot of the discussions that you're having for funding and because you have already been talking about what it is the unfunded status, where are these obligations. Um, it's just going to be making it more routine for every government across the United States to have to report it in the same fashion. But like you said, in regards to you know, bringing, bringing that to the forefront and potentially exactly like you said, it could uh, put some organizations into some serious situations with the debt covenants. And at that point, because it's now reflected on your balance sheet as a, as, as a significant liability for some organizations, and at that point, there could be, I mean, some of your debt holders could require higher contributions right. to, to go towards that overall debt liability. Right. We don't, you know, the, the Financial Accounting Standards Board required this to, it's been implemented for probably about 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and now the GASB side's following suit in some fashion. They have to change up a bit because it can't be exactly like GASB. Um, it, it, we're following the standard. You know, in, it, when I look back at it, at first when they brought it out, um, it, the knee-jerk rea reaction was, oh no, this is going to do a lot of work. Uh, the second reaction is that we are really going to start seeing transparency. So one thing that I'm very, uh, that I think is promising about the TriMet Board and TriMet Management is the continual discussions. Um, as you know, I'm a new partner on the disengagement. 
and uh, having and looking back in the minutes and learning and researching and listening to the board, um, it's been important to see that you're actually tackling the issue and talking about the issue. I can promise you uh, that with a significant about amount of boards and entities that I work with in the governmental arena, uh, this, this conversation, this is going to spur the conversation because the conversation is just not being had. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. And th this statement was just issued in June of this year, and, and so everybody's, it, it, we're in the digestion period right now, so hopefully we're gonna start seeing. Like, that's weird, okay. <laughs> 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 we got it. Trying to digest the eight hundred pages that came out from Gatsby in June. But essentially that's, and we, we'd be glad to continue, yeah. And we'll, we'll be talking with management too as, as more as information is known. Mr. Board President, if I could just interject a, a Board Member Stovall's question. He tells me that we don't have any debt or lease transactions that this would affect uh, in terms of the triggers of, of additional capitalization. So uh, we've avoided that problem anyway. Other questions from the Board? Comments? I guess I'd just say thank you for your work. Uh, really pleased with the opinion and uh, the information. I think it is fair that uh, uh, we will have some more discussions about OPEB and uh, uh, pension liabilities uh, in the future here at this board. We know that's something we have to deal with anyway. So it will be highlighted, as you said, much more uh, in, the, in the future. So uh, we'll look forward to that dialogue. Uh, again, uh, at the last finance committee, uh, our chair was not there. Uh, 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 Director Prosser and myself had an opportunity to go through this in detail. And, uh, and again, it's a good piece of work. I want to also acknowledge the staff. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Board President, uh, thank you again, Ross Adams, staff, for, for uh, all the great work that was uh, a good interest. And I wanted to particularly note Lori Baker's uh, involvement in this. And she is really in charge of all of the efforts that go on to uh, ensure compliance. And so needless to say, it's, a, it's an eight plus, so you can qualified opinion. And she's certainly done that. Everybody knows Lori, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that does conclude my report, unless there are questions of board. Questions of the general manager? Oh, I just had to just ask you, Ross. Um, the folks, Ross Adams, you lose. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll be giving the finance committee report in just a minute here. So if you could oh, hang around right, just in case uh, additional questions come up. Okay, sure. Sorry. Questions for general manager? I guess I just wanted to say, for the record, first off, all of the board members, with the exception of Director Schweitzer, had an opportunity to ride in one of the buses on the tour of the Fort Milwaukee Light Rail Project. It's a wonderful, wonderful bus. Uh, I think the public is going to enjoy it a lot. Some thought has gone into the, to the you know, everything from the seat coverings to the, to the it went to the aisles for accessible transportation. So uh, I thought it was a, a really good one. I think the public is really going to enjoy those. It was surprising to me the number of choices that end up being need to be made to bring your bus into production. So um, I'm, I'm glad that the overall result seems to be meeting that expectation. And I guess the other thing I just wanted to say publicly is I really want to acknowledge the, the hard work of, of, of the general manager and staff and Clackamas County, the Board of County Commissioners in particular, to actually uh, deal with the uh, contentious issue of living up to their commitments for their share of the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail project. It's my understanding where you have the cash in hand, so their, their uh, commitment has been fulfilled, and I think it's a good piece of work on everybody's part to get that done. Uh, they could have buckled underneath all of the pressure that was going on. I understand they were there till about midnight dealing with this particular issue and had uh, a couple hundred folks testifying for and against. So I just want to acknowledge them for, uh, for the hard work and the intestinal fortitude to actually move forward and honor that financial commitment. Appreciate that, and I'll certainly pass it on to our members. Thank, thank you so much. Okay, moving on to the uh, Finance Committee report. Uh, uh, Mr. Prosser, I think you're going to give the report today. Right, and um, thanks for the excellent report um, you gave. Uh, I really don't have that much more to add, but I, I did want them to, to uh, stick around in case anybody had any additional questions. Um, you know, I think it is important that this isn't an qualified opinion, um, the, the best um, opinion we can get on, on an audit. Uh, that's the goal. And uh, I know that staff has worked very hard to achieve that and um, really want to thank staff. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, a lot of adjustments. Um, this was an extremely timely piece of work. 
in my experience, um, I've not seen one completed this fast, quite, quite honestly. So uh, it takes a lot of time and effort to do that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is in the, the uh, Finance Committee, of course, um, Bruce and I were there. Uh, Tiffany, unfortunately, was unable to join us. Um, but we had staff and we had the audit team. So it was a really uh, good opportunity to ask questions and, and get more detail. Um, at, at, uh, towards the end of the meeting, though, staff uh, was excused from the room. And so Bruce and I had the opportunity to meet with um, the audit team on a one-to-one -one basis without staff uh, present. And so that was an opportunity that if they found anything of concern, they could communicate directly to the board. Uh, um, I'm pleased to say that um, there was um, nothing um, major or that they needed to communicate. The one thing that we did talk about is uh, they have made some suggestions for improved security on our IT systems, um, and uh, I understand that, uh, those improvements are underway. And then uh, lastly, we did talk quite a bit about these changes coming down from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Um, it is um, a major change. This is a, really a sea change in governmental accounting. Um, and it will not uh, only affect crime, it's going to affect every um, jurisdiction. And so we're going to be seeing some major changes, and um, I think it's going to facilitate some really good discussions. Uh, and, and Travis, I think you kind of opened the door there with, with your question. Um, but this is going to be going on with uh, local governments all over, over this nation. And so as we have those discussions, um, I think it's important for us to keep that in, in mind keep our discussions in context. We're, we're not going to be alone with, with what we're dealing with. And, and um, hopefully, um, you know, with the good team we have and, and the able help of Moss Adams, um, we're going to be able to, to jump in with both feet and really make some good progress. So that's the Finance Committee report. And if you have any questions, and particularly since I may have made if you have any more questions, <laughs> Questions for uh, Director Crosser? Thank you very much. Very much. Say, I don't oh, have say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's along the same lines. I, you know, my mind's just racing as to the impact. And I, you know, from the response that we've got from General Manager Neil McFarland, uh, in that we may not have any uh, major issues associated with this. My concern further goes to other government entities that we may receive funding from. That may be impacted by these right. by the by these uh, new regulations. So that's another concern that goes along those lines. I don't know if that's a valid concern, sure. but uh, for me, it's just it, my mind just continues to go along that continuum to say, okay, we may be talking about this, but if those other agencies that we receive funding from aren't. That's a that's something that I think we also need to put uh, in the back of our minds in regards to how do we deal with this potential change of regulations as it comes down the road. I think that's an excellent point. So it wasn't really a question. <laughs> well, it was a good comment. Yeah. Good comment. Other comments or questions? All right, thank you. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Dr. Bentham, you have a report on the committee for on accessible transportation? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Mr. President, good morning, board members, and to those of you in the audience. Um, the committee on accessible transportation did meet. You do have a copy of the report highlights um, in your packet for this morning. Just a couple of things I want to add to that is one um, of a comment made by James Jackson during the meeting. It was in reference as we were talking about the whole lift process of reservations um, that make the customer a part of the team. That is as they're talking to the individuals about uh, making a reservation for pickups and drop-offs, that you talk with the customer that it's currently, as I understand what we have, as a call goes in, it goes to another person, then it gets to a dispatcher. And a couple of them had some issues where they were delivered to the wrong address. Mm -hmm. Only because, in these cases, some of them regularly go there, uh -huh. but the request was to go to someplace different on that day. And so they're saying if they're part of the team, that maybe a lot of these things could be um, erased and eliminated. Second is that they're going to have some suggestions for bylaws coming to us. Uh, 
basically, I don't see really any issue with what they're proposing. However, however, I do want to encourage the board to do some discussion around the piece that's being proposed of no break between terms. And proposing that as a person is running for a particular office or is being you know, up for appointment, that once their term ends, that if they're not, they don't have to stay off for a year, they can just come right back, come right back, come right back. So I want to encourage us to think about that and do some discussion um, when that time comes. And um, hopefully, I'm afraid it will give you as well as what he presented at that time, some information of the history of what happened around that. And hopefully we don't go back into the same thing again. That concludes my report, unless there's some questions. Questions for Dr. I do have a question. When might it be appropriate to talk about that? Because I've already had some discussion about that this morning in terms of the bylaws or how you know, we can respond or help um, with that issue. I mean, is that something that's coming up that we can put on an agenda? Is it something we can? Um, if I might interject, I think that's probably a last quarter of the fiscal year kind of conversation. We just updated the camp membership with uh, updated membership roster that they'll work through this fiscal year's uh, work program, which I know is on the agenda for their October meeting. And uh, so then as that work program is completed, then we take a position of looking at uh, updating the, uh, the roster. So we'll see at the end of this year. So it's the same. Right. We'll see it next month. Uh, we'll leave it to you to schedule it. Mr. Mm -hmm. and Mr. John. Okay. Other questions uh, for Dr. Ben? Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the report. Thank you. Good report. Uh, so the last item on the general manager and board reports is a uh, discussion of the unrestricted fund balance and the contingency policy. Are you going to get that off, uh, Neil? Or uh, if, you know, what I would do is just sort of note that we had a very thorough discussion of this at a previous briefing. Uh, I know that the Finance and Audit Committee have also looked at this very thoroughly. Uh, this completes really what I would say are sort of the three key financial policies that we believe uh, really are important to the ongoing governance of the agency. And this really begins, again, the important thing for us is that this would begin to give us direction for the preparation of the budgets on an annual basis to make sure that we're in compliance with this policy. And again, this is not a straitjacket. This is a flexible policy that establishes a standard, a standard and then would allow us to work with the board to make sure that the standard is appropriate for the time, the situation that we're facing. And um, if we're not able to meet the standard in any one year, that there would be a work program to, and, and, and a schedule to actually uh, be in compliance with this. Uh, we believe that this is a very sound policy um, and is, um, again, relatively cons uh, not conservative in the sense of money, but actually not, uh, not a, it doesn't create a great uh, deal of, of reserve. It's really pre-targeted uh, to the business needs of climate and the cash flows of climate over a period of time. So with that, I would certainly defer to members of the Finance and Audit Committee. And uh, again, we've had other conversations with the board we have to answer any questions. As I know, Dave Box here would as well. So uh, it was a topic that the Finance Committee, maybe, uh, Craig, I know you spent quite a bit of time on it. And Tiffany, you did too, so maybe you have some comments or thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah um, we have uh, looked at this over um, Couple months now. Um, I, I'm very supportive of this policy. I think it's, it's well crafted. Um, one of the key elements of this, and, and any policy, I think, is that it, it really um, <coughs> makes very evident, puts out in a clear and objective manner what our goals and our standards are. Um, so as we get into the budgeting process, as we get into our financial management pro um, uh, process, everybody knows. Kind of what the rules of the road, the, the, what our goals, what we're trying to achieve, what are, what are um, the, the factors that we need to take into um, consideration and that we should take into consideration. Um, so in that, in that sense, I think it, it adds to transparency of the organization as well as providing um, 
guidance to the staff and the board um, on how we approach it, um, these types of issues. Um, we did have a lot of discussion about it. We, we did do some tweaks as we went through the process. Um, and I think it's um, a, a very good piece of work. Yeah. I think it's been a while, so I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, I agree. I think um, simplifies a bit. Comments and hopefully it'll make it easier as we start looking at uh, this next budget year. Um, because as usual, we'll have quite a lot to tackle. So. I guess I just add as the other member on, on the committee looking at this, this is a good piece of work, and it, it, there was a lot of discussion about the levels and the, and the type of monies we, we need to have in reserve and contingency to be able to deal with uh, our cash flow and, and just ongoing work of the agency. So I think having this an adopted policy by the board would be very helpful, especially as we move into the development of the next, next year's budget. Um, is there other questions or comments from this, this, this end of the class? Steve? So, uh, thank you. Just, this may sound like editing, but uh, I it's think okay. it actually, uh, <laughs> it's, it's about, yeah. Uh, in the, in the, uh, the policy itself, the second bullet, Contingency will be based, uh, will be budgeted at 3% of total operating requirements in each budget or based on an assessment of expenditure risk. Uh, I, I guess I would encourage us to think that uh, maybe the way to say this is we'll be budgeted at least at 3% and based on an uh, assessment because what, what really our intent, our legislative intent here is to stipulate this threshold level which won't go below, below but it might go higher based upon uh, an assessment of risk. Is that a, a, a fair? Yeah. Um, we like your editorial comments. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> we like it. Keep doing it. The third bullet, um, this is really editing. <laughs> average monthly operating expenditures versus expenditure. And in that uh, second, uh, in that sentence, uh, are, are we saying that we are uh, uh, pleased or we will accept simply that we will uh, get to the 2.5 or a plan must be in place or, or uh, we, we must at least have the operating two point five projected average monthly operating expenditure for that fiscal year or a plan. Uh, at what point does simply having a plan maybe that's insufficient financially? Does that make any sense? You're saying we have a plan every year? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> does a statement that we're gonna must be at least two and a half times projected? average monthly operating expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year or a plan. I mean, we may never get to the achievement of that if we simply have the plan. Uh, I hear what you're saying. Maybe that's a good comment. Um, what I'm thinking here, uh, you know, is that this wasn't uh, identified as an action item. I think we want to adopt this. Yes, we do. Um, the question is, is there any reason or, or is there any, uh, anything wrong with well, these over and actually putting it on the agenda as a, as a formal uh, resolution and adoption, and we can incorporate some of these minor changes into, into the document based on that. And then also, we have opportunity to know from, from the audience wants to talk about it since you know this was an issue. We'd be happy to have that. Is that okay with the board? Okay, let's do that then. But first off, is there any other comments or questions? Yeah, those are really good comments. I don't want to cut off the discussion. Anybody else have any other thoughts or comments on this one? Well, I'd say is take a look at these comments, bring it back to us at our next regular meeting for actual approval, uh, and then we can, again, do a formal adoption at that time. Okay? Thank you. All right. Did you have anything else on this, on this item? No, um, and we'll be happy to come back. I think there is a reason, of course, for the for plan. So what we want to do is to sort of walk through that with you so that you understand. There may be 